Next up, we have Craig Bishop giving a talk called Why Autoriders Suck and How to Use Them Anyways. Craig Bishop is a founder of Mango Dynamics, a software engineering consulting and EDA company. He has worked on custom EDA software and bespoke auto routers for semiconductor packaging over the last eight years. Currently, he's working to overflow, overthrow the tyranny of awful auto routing and design technology, one Steiner net at a time. He also blogs random and sometimes mildly useful things at craiggb.com. Please welcome them to the stage. Hi, everyone. Thanks. So today, I want to talk to you about auto routers. And uh, I know that's kind of an uncomfortable topic sometimes for layout engineers. Uh, but instead, of it would be really easy to get up here and just talk for a long time about why they suck and show you example after example of why they suck. But I kind of want to take a different approach. Uh, so I spent a lot of time working on the internals of auto routers. And I want to go the other way and kind of talk about why do they suck? And can we actually do anything about that? And if I wanted to use one anyway, like to route a bunch of stuff I don't have constraints on, how can I do that with KiCad? So we're going to talk about why should I even care about auto routers, because it might take a little bit of convincing. And we'll talk about a brief history of router routing, how we got to the current state of suckiness. Uh, we'll look at what the auto router landscape looks like today, if you want to use one and how to use a specific auto router free routing in KiCad. And then we'll look at briefly at the exciting future of auto routers, which I think are about to take off. So first, what is an auto router? Well, put simply, it's a piece of software that does this. So this is normally the process that we do manually or interactively when working in KiCad or other layout software, where we take our rat's nest, our net list, and one route at a time make a dent in the unconnected. And eventually, we have a fully routed board. And this is, this is an animation showing what it looked like using an auto router. So in this case, it's making all those decisions for you. And the, the routing, instead of manually thinking about the constraints on the board, you're using an automated system, inputting those constraints, and it's solving the problem for you. And now, here's kind of a harder question, is why should we care about auto routers? Because I route all my boards by hand. It works just fine. There's no way a computer can do that job for me. And there's some people in the room that engage in things like this. They create t-shirts. <laughs> people of my kind are not so fond of, and <laughs> they create other variants of it. And I mean, there's a reason. That is a mess. But I'm going to convince you otherwise. So first, we have to go back to the fact that PCB prototyping costs have plummeted. It is dirt cheap to make a prototype nowadays, especially for a two-layer board. You're talking like eight bucks at the cheapest, maybe $15. Uh, even four-layer costs have plummeted, so I prototype all my stuff in four-layer now. Uh, Six-layer is still on the same linear curve that's accessible to small volume and prototype and hobbyists. Eight-layer is now the boundary of where you might not be a small hobbyist or contractor or small business. Uh, and that's changing quickly, too. So pretty soon, 10 layer and up will be pros, and everything below will be open to us. And so this is uh, showing the costs for you know, like a 100 by 100 millimeter board, which is actually pretty big. So buying a prototype, super cheap nowadays. There's no excuse not to. And at the same time, CAD tools are abundant for all price ranges. And now, some of us may not remember times when you couldn't get a CAD tool for free from the KiCad website, but it was there. You used to have a choice of you know, big boys like Cadence or Mentor or Zookin, and if you wanted to buy it, well, you had to call a physical person and talk to them. It was uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> you had uh, other software like Altium uh, down in Australia or Pads, and there's a bunch of others, but these are kind of like the higher t tier but not quite paying through the nose like Cadence. Uh, you have tools like Eagle and Orcad, and these are kind of like, these have tiers all the way down to low cost, and these are super widespread now. And finally, the reason we're all here, we have KiCad, which is free and open source and has a quickly growing feature set and community. And this is actually incredibly important because one of the things that, about all these other tools is there's no unified community. The community split into all these different fractured pieces around each tool. So, for example, something as simple as a footprint library 
becomes specific to a tool. Oh, do you have that footprint for Eagle? Oh, we only have it for Altium. But with KiCad, everyone can focus the efforts on one common tool, which is awesome. So what do these two things mean? Well, it means that I'm not paying for prototyping, or I'm paying very little. I'm not paying for my CAD tool, and it's getting more awesome by the minute. Well, now my time matters the most. I'm not worried about cost at all. In fact, my manufacturing CAD no longer dominate any part of my prototyping cost. It's 100% engineering time and how I spend it. So for hobbyists, we want to maximize learning the interesting parts, we want to enjoy it, the process, and we want to make progress quickly. So typically that means I want built boards or something working very fast. For independent contractors or consultants like myself or small companies, we want to maximize productivity. I don't have very many people and I'm typically charging by the hour or building up for product. I need to maximize productivity. Every engineer's minute needs to matter. For industry, they want to minimize time to market. All these things point to auto routers, because guess what they do best? They save time. So routing is typically manual, often repetitive, and non-innovative, and I realize that last word's gonna cause some anger, but how often does how you routed your PCB differentiate your work? And I'm not talking about artistic, because that, that's its own thing, uh, but how often does the way you routed that trace to your switch or your LED make or break your product? Not very often. So I argue with prototyping costs so low, rather than spend so much time perfectly crafting and simulating a CAD design, uh, and perfectly crafting means spending painstaking hours getting my routing perfect, that won't matter. It's cheaper and quicker just to build it, get it in my lab and test it on the bench. And same thing goes for power issues, signal integrity issues, lots of these you can spend endless hours trying to route it perfectly and still get it wrong. I always get something wrong on my PCB, maybe some of you don't, but I find it's easier to test. And so with that, we might say, okay, you may have convinced me that auto routers can save them time, but I've heard that auto routers suck and I shouldn't trust them. So where did that come from? And to answer that question, we're gonna go in a brief history of auto routing. And this is kind of a tale of dis slow disillusionment from the first AI high of the 1950s and learning the problems way harder than anyone thought. In fact, when I was getting ready for this talk, I read uh, Wikipedia actually has a tiny little section on auto routing for EDA. And it says, the long list of often conflicting objectives makes routing extremely difficult. Almost every problem associated with it is known to be computationally intractable. <laughs> so, so I'm a hardware guy who also does software, and so this drew me like a fly to a light. This is the problem I want to solve. And it all starts with mazes. So uh, back in the 1950s, even solving a maze like this, which today you may think is, looks like a really straightforward software problem, is actually an incredibly complicated problem. Uh, and this guy, super smart guy named Claude Shannon, you may have heard of him because he invented information theory. Uh, back in the 1950s, he created the first computer maze, computerized maze solver. And computer is a stretch of the word here. So it was a reconfigurable maze and you put a little mouse in the maze, and the mouse finds its way to the cheese, wherever you put the cheese in the maze. And it worked underneath this board, there's actually a large amount of relays that click and switches that detect where the cheese is, and the, but the machine will learn where the cheese is and navigate through the maze. So Shannon, he built this, he called it Theseus, uh, and because, you know, it's a labyrinth, and he got distracted by better things like, you know, founding the core concept of all information and in digital electronics, so that's fine. But luckily, other people picked up the slack. So in 1961, a guy named Lee created what's called Lee's algorithm. And it's important to note that at this time, uh, printed circuit boards weren't that widespread, and integrated circuits were just at the very beginning. So most of the work on auto routing was mostly theoretical at this time, so not a lot of practical application. And this looks very familiar to the previous slide. It, you can think of it as a maze. So my chips here are the walls of the maze. And usually I want to route between some pins of the chip. And Lee's algorithm is actually conceptually really simple. I promise I won't go into super detail here. But basically we start at one point and I count outward. So I start at 
one right next to my pin, and I go to twos, threes, fours, and once I hit where I want to go, I backtrack, and I follow the numbers back to where I started, and that becomes my trace. And this is conceptually incredibly simple, but it's actually the basis of even really complicated routing algorithms today. They still follow backtracking once you reach your destination, because it's inherently a search problem. And so Lee's algorithm, he published about this in 1961. It's a famous paper. All the routers out there reference it at some point. Um, but it really wasn't until the 1960s and 70s when computerized design and early CAD tools started taking off. And actually, printed circuit boards were more common. And really, the big driver, too, was that integrated circuits were coming along and starting to add complex amounts of digital logic that were, they couldn't route that by hand if they wanted to, because it was too large. So in the 1960s through the late 70s, maze routers dominated. And maze routers are named literally after the maze. That's, uh, so they use some variant of Lee's algorithm. They have other performance enhancements, like maybe it's not a maze, maybe I shoot lines and see where they take me. But what you'll see is that this can work really well if you have a lot of dip packages. So like all these examples here, they're like uh, rows of dip packages, which is really common in the 70s and 80s. And they look like mazes. So a maze router actually makes sense here. Uh, now it does run into some problems, like the figure in the middle shows you when two nets kind of conflict, and one net routes first and it blocks the other one. Maze routers have a miserable approach for overcoming that problem. Basically, you have to rip up and reroute it, which doesn't always work because you can have conflicts that cause you to cycle back and forth. And so these routers, they worked all right for huge PCBs full of dip packages that had no constraints because, you know, it's running at 10 megahertz, which is DC. So no worries. Um, and this is actually where a lot of people who've been in the industry for a long time get their terrible conceptions about auto routers because these routers, I mean, they were early. They didn't work so well. So now we go to the 1980s, and this is where things start to get less intuitive and more theoretical, but they start to pave the way toward modern state-of-the-art routing. And this is where integrated circuit industry for making the billions of wires on uh, integrated circuits starts taking over everything. So they have a lot of problems that look like this. They have rectangles, because almost everything on an integrated circuit's a rectangle, and they have terminals on the sides of these rectangles I want to connect. And so they called this a channel. And they say, how do I do channel routing? And they create, how many horizontal wires do I need in the middle to do this? And I can solve this really efficiently without the maze. Because the biggest drawbacks of the maze is, if you're designing a modern board, that maze is massive. There's no way it's going to fit in your RAM. And it's going to take way too long to explore the maze. So what do I do? I turn to graph theory. And graph theory gives me all kinds of neat, compact solutions to these routing problems, where I don't have to explore a maze. It kind of compresses all that empty space that otherwise you'd have to explore with your maze. It compresses it into a graph where just one node represents all that space. And for the non-computer science people of us here, basically later 80s and early 90s circuit boards that were full of dip packages were often channel routed. And here, again, it makes a lot of sense because the spacing between the dip packages kind of look like rectangles, look like rectangular channels. I can treat them like that. I have long, narrow rows between all the uh, chips, and I treat those like channels. So my channel routing it actually kind of makes sense. Um, but this starts to fall apart once you add uh, non-rectangular chips or chips with four sides, uh, like QFPs or QFNs, because no longer do I have a pretty channel where I can route everything horizontally. So that's where we start to get to in the early 90s to today. Uh, we had the advent of shape-based routing. So shape-based routing, instead of trying to divide everything into pretty rectangles, we just divide it into rectangles kind of as it is. And then we treat all these small rectangles as smaller problems. Um, and then in the early 90s, this guy, uh, Tal Dian, uh, present, uh, did a PhD thesis about a thing called topological auto routing. And this is an even more mathematical abstract way to think about routing, where I turn everything into triangles. And it may sound silly, but triangles, since they're the simplest two-dimensional shape, actually can cover the entire design space. And now all I have to worry about is where wires cross triangles. And a cr another crazy thing he did 
is he made it so that way I'm not trying to figure out exactly where my wire should go, I'm just trying to figure out what wires it should go around or what order the wires should go in, and then I figure out exactly what my wire should be at the, the very end. So uh, this is current state of the art, and it creates results like that. So if we take a look at what auto routers are out there today, uh, there's big boys like Caden Spectra, it's shape-based, and I, I've heard it has topological routing in the latest versions, but it costs a lot of money, and interestingly, it's licensed and used by a ton of CAD tools that have auto routers. A lot of time, they just put this tool inside. Uh, there's another tool called Connect Electra. It's shape-based, so in it, modern shape-based routers, they don't just use rectangles, they do all kinds of shapes. Uh, there's one called Topo R, which is a very good tool, uh, and it's decently affordable uh, topological router. And then finally, there's the one I'm gonna talk about next called Free Routing, which is a shape-based, uh, and it's free and open source. It has somewhat limited feature set, but for a lot of very simple boards, it's completely wor workable. So this brings me to the next topic, which is if I want to dabble in these dark arts, how do I use an auto router in KiCad? And we'll use Free Routing since it's free and open source, and actually the process of exporting to KiCad to Free Routing and getting back is the same for almost all the other routers. So you can actually use Topo R, Spectra, the other ones with KiCad. It'll work just fine. So first, uh, downloading uh, to get started with KiCad is actually a little bit complicated uh, if you're on a Mac. So you go to GitHub. Uh, if you hit binaries, download the exe or jar, uh, and you have free routing. If you're in Mac, this gets interesting because there's actually a crash issue if you just download these binaries. So you've got to go to uh, the issues tab and then you look at the top issue, which you'll get if you search your crash you got. And then some guy published a fix in a zip, download that zip, I tried it, it hasn't crashed my computer, it works. Uh, so that gets you free routing, which is I think one of the few if only open source free auto routers. So. Worth a try. Um, now, this is a critical step. Before I go off and auto route, even if I'm doing a simple you know, two layer board with micro and no sensitive analog stuff, I typically wanna route high current paths first. So this board, as an example, you see the red uh, large traces at the top. This was a battery charging board and it had some power supply, so I routed those high current paths first. Uh, if you have switching regulators, usually the data sheet tells you how to route it, so you probably want to follow that first. Uh, clock lines, if they're sensitive, a lot of clock lines really aren't that sensitive. Uh, match length pairs, free routing doesn't support that, other routers do. Uh, sensitive analog, this is critical, uh, and if you have it, you know it. Uh, another one that's kind of a gotcha is split plane, so let's say you have a digital uh, power or digital ground, and then you have ground, uh, analog ground, and you wanna keep them separate back to the supply, typically you would disconnect those nets from each other before you auto route. So otherwise it'll connect it on places you didn't plan on them being connected. And then after you auto route, you reconnect the nets and tie them back together. But these are just kinda like things to take care of before you go in auto routing. And now in KiCad to get the file out of KiCad to the auto router, I use the export to Spectra DSN. It's a Super old format, but it's used by everything because it's the most standard we have. Uh, you export a DSN file, and then in, key, uh, in free routing, uh, when you open it, you just get this window that has one button, so it's pretty easy to figure out what to do. Uh, you click the big button, and you open your DSN file, and now it's in free routing. And I took a lot of time to play with the colors to get it to appear this pretty. It is kind of washed out when you first open it. Uh, but it has all kinds of settings that you can play with, but the critical ones for actually getting a board routed are all under the rules menu. So in the rules menu, I need to set up things, uh, my rules for spacing, my rules for trace width, and free routing is all based on net classes, so anyone who's not used a net class, it's a way of saying that this net belongs to this group of rules about it. Uh, so you might have like high speed nets, or ground nets, or power nets. And so the net classes uh, configuration and free routing lets me set up things like the trace width for each class of nets or the trace width on each layer. And this tripped me up. So these on layer combo boxes, when you change it, it changes the thing next to it, which is kind of tricky at first, but 
If you use it, you'll figure it out. Uh, all the measurements here are microns, which we're not used to working with in PCB land, but one micron's about 25, uh, or one mil is about 25 microns. Um, and don't worry about the minimum length box. I read the manual, it says don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> the maximum length box apparently does work. Uh, again, it's in microns, and if you put negative one, it means no limit. Intuitive. Um, and so usually one tip is I usually add uh, power ground to net class, and you can have separate or the same, but usually I want my grounds and powers to have thicker traces, and if I set up the beginning, at least then I know I'm more likely to be able to turn them into planes later, large planes. Uh, it'll maintain clearance for that. Lastly, I have to set up a clearance matrix. So this says from this thing to this thing, what's the minimum spacing I should have? Uh, and again, it's all in microns, not mils. And I don't know if you can adjust that. Uh, last confusing thing is setting up the vias that the router is allowed to use. So it actually has a window that you create different size vias that it's allowed to use, um, and it will use them preferred from the top down. So typically you have like a big via at the top, use that if you can, otherwise use this small via. And then finally, I'm ready to let it rip. I hit the auto router button, lots of stuff happens very fast, hopefully it's good. And now I wanna export to KiCad. So to do that, I go to the file menu, and I don't save, or I don't save and exit, because if you do that, you'll overwrite your DSN file, so don't click that. Click export session file, and then I go back to KiCad, and I go file, import, Spectra session. And now, all my routes appear in KiCad. And quick gotchas, refill your zones after you run free routing, because it will route things through your zone, and run DRC, always run DRC. And this is why auto routers have the reputation they do. So for example, uh, this uh, power plane here was split by an auto router trace, and it's kind of the auto router's fault, but also like software only does as good as its input, and I learned like, uh, the auto router needs a trace inside the plane, even though it's a plane. So there's ways around it. And a few really quick KiCad tips. Uh, when you're using auto routing, I find myself ripping up stuff. Uh, and to select a track and press U selects up to the nearest pad or I think to the nearest branch point. Really handy. And then the other really handy one is if you select a track and press I, it selects the entire net, including the vias, which is really handy. And I didn't know that before. I never had to rip up that many things. <laughs> so now I want to talk about the, so that's how you would use an auto router, freely available auto router today, and it's good for simple boards. Uh, and the other auto routers that are available for money today are good for complicated things, but they all require a long time to set up and to set up the constraints. And the quality of your auto routing is typically only as good as the constraints you set up. Um, but I think that's gonna change in the future. So a lot of the constraints are incredibly standardized. Other constraints I can guess pretty well and you can correct me if I'm wrong as the auto router. Um, so I think we're going to see adaptive heuristics in auto routing using deep learning. And smart guys at Altium and their auto routing team are already, already going down this path where they want to learn from human routed boards to learn what heuristics to apply when you're uh, routing using a topological router. Um, I think it's really smart. I don't quite think it's just waving the magic wand of AI at this point, because we actually have very well-constrained problems we're trying to solve with machine learning, not just, we'll make a board with AI. Um, also, we have seen an exponential increase in compute power uh, and only a linear increase in PCB complexity. So we're not the IC industry, where they started with four microns in the 1970s and went to four nanometers today, and they have billions of wires, that's exponential, that requires an entirely different class of problem solving. We've only gone from 15 mil traces in the 70s, and you could buy four mil if you had money in the 70s, uh, or 80s, I guess, and today you can buy four mil PCBs, maybe one mil. So it's not that massive of an increase in complexity, and at the same time, computation speed has made leaps and bounds over that. And now we have cloud compute, so we can just throw compute at the problem. Uh, and it's tough to parallelize auto routing, but it can be done. Uh, and the last thing, which I really enjoyed Dave's talk this morning, because we need machine readable circuit description. And this is part of giving more constraints, I get better routing out. 
Um, so things like Skittle allow me to, those library components can also include a lot of information about how the routing should look. So this is what I think the future PCB design will look like. We have requirements and planning, that's like normal. Then we have part selection, which is kind of really early on. Uh, we go, have a circuit description language. I'm hook, line, and sinker on Dave's talk. Uh, some of that can come from GitHub, distributors, manufacturers. They can help you create those libraries. We go to verification, simulation, and we have helpers to take chunks of my circuit out for simulation uh, and set up the simulation. Uh, and that can be automated, CI, CD. I know there's another talk about that. We have floor planning, so I place the important things. And then I go to auto routing, and these are good auto routers, uh, topological based with adaptive heuristics, and I get Gerbers. So the whole thing looks like software compiling and testing. And I think that's the way the industry is going to go, and I believe it enough, I'm starting a company to do it. So thank you. Uh, I'm Craig. You can email me. That's probably the best way. But I'm also on Twitter, Craig underscore J Bishop. Thank you.